All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. I am Chief Dave Sentner with the Hinckley Police Department, and we're here this morning to talk about scams. Um, unfortunately, with um, technology expanding the way it has over the years, um, we there's there's no end to the scams that we're seeing, and it's very difficult for us to even keep up with everything they're thinking about out there. So I welcome you this morning. Um, it's our goal to inform our community about the various scams that are impacting our residents. And while our short time together will cover many of these scams, we can't cover all of them. Um, we encourage everyone to maintain a level of skepticism when confronting by or with anyone who wants you to freely send your money to them. This morning, we've got four presenters. Uh, Detective Jeff Kinney is going to talk to you a little bit about what we've seen here in Hinkley. Uh, Brennan Long has a long history in law enforcement as a private investigator that investigates these types of activities. Uh, John Jaroska has an uh, internet security company out of Medina. And Brian McDonough is an as assistant attorney general with uh, for the United States out of Cleveland. So we will... With that, we will start. Detective Kinney's going to go first. Jeff's been with us for about 10 years. He's got experience in patrol investigations. He's also an expert state of Ohio drug recognition. And his current assignment is our detective. With that, Jeff. Good morning. So um, when Chief Sentner asked me to put together something for this um, information meeting today, I went back and I looked through. I've been the department detective for two, little, two and a half, maybe three years now. So I went back and I looked at all of the cases, the different types of cases that, that I have been investigating. Um, and I came up with four of them that are probably most prevalent. Then I've got two that were, are fairly new. Um, and I've only had like one case of each, but I think they're um, probably, I, I don't want to, I would guess up and coming types of scams that are gonna start occurring more often. Um, so the first one that I have is um, we get a lot of complaints of utility companies uh, calling residents and requesting uh, some form of immediate payment. They convinced the homeowner or the resident that, you know, their last payment uh, was not received. And um, in order to keep them from being shut off, they want uh, that resident to go to some place like CVS um, or um, and purchase a gift card. And the common scam is that they get that person to give them the gift card number and the secret code on the back of that gift card. Um, and once they give them that number, those numbers, that person is online and it has immediate access to those funds. And once it's gone, it's gone. We can't get it back. Um, nine times out of 10, the, the scammer is from someplace overseas. So the money transfers out of the country and um, the homeowner or resident is, is left on the hook for, for that money, even though uh, they've probably already paid their, their utility bill. Um, my next uh, scam is with the Internal Revenue Service or like the Department of Treasury. Um, <clears throat> most commonly, they, they, a resident is receiving a telephone call from a government agency. And, and again, it's either the IRS or Department of Treasury calling to tell you that there's been some fraudulent activity on uh, your social security number or your uh, checking and savings accounts or your investment accounts. Um, and they convince the homeowner that they're real. Uh, these types of things happen because they can get uh, what's like a text now or it's a, a telephone number that's voice over IP and they can give it a name. So when they call you, it comes up uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Department of Treasury or whatever it is that they can, can hack in and, and send it. So when you're receiving this phone call, you actually think, you know, it's coming from a 202 area code. It's coming from Washington, D.C. This guy must really be um, somebody with the Department of Treasury, for, for example. Um, and they convince you to do all sorts of things. I think probably the strangest and the wildest one was uh, relatively recently, 
Um, I had a resident who was told that he had uh, fraudulent activity in his accounts, in his accounts, and he had a number of them. And this um, John from the Department of Treasury convinced him to um, withdraw cash. Um, and the plan was the resident would withdraw the cash. He would place it in a box. And John from the Department of Treasury would send a courier by to pick up the cash, put it in a safe for him. And once his account, the fraudulent activity on his account was uh, resolved, he would get his money back. Um, unfortunately, um, the resident came to us a little too late. <clears throat> he had already put some money in the box and it was gone. I did some investigation um, and I do have tools that I can use and I certainly will, um, but I found that the text now phone number that this guy called from um, actually originated uh, in India. Once I find that it happened that, that the crime com was committed outside the United States of America, I have very little, if any, jurisdiction or ability to do anything to, to help that resident. So unfortunately, in that case, um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I'm done with it, uh, but there are other agencies that can take a look at those types of crimes and potentially help that, that victim. Um, so no government agency is ever going to tell you, withdraw your money, put it in a box, and I'll come and pick it up and keep it for you. So my next type of scam, um, it's somewhat common, it's kind of old. You'll, uh, you could potentially be at home late in the evening or early in the morning and you get a call from a state or local law enforcement agency. Again, they're utilizing these, these uh, voice over IP text now type phone numbers and they're, pl they're plugging in, um, it may say Hinkley PD when it comes up on your caller ID on your phone and you answer it. And what then winds up happening is um, typically the most common scam is it, it's a grandparent and when they answer the phone they get hi grandma hi grandpa you know and they give you a name of actually one of your grandchildren um, and they tell you that they're in some kind of trouble maybe they had a car accident maybe they um, got arrested for driving under the influence and they need bail money um, and they're asking you again to either wire transfer uh, money to the police department or to get a gift card and give them that phone number. Um, and there's also, I, I've had variations where they're asking for like cryptocurrency. Um, I had one uh, incident where a resident traveled to um, a gas station in Medina at the corner of Lafayette and Court. There is a cryptocurrency ATM machine. So basically you drive down there, you put hundreds of dollars into this crypto machine and they give you it, it gives you a receipt and a number and that's where your money is well the scammer wants that information and as soon as he gets it he withdraws the cash and and now you're out um <clears throat> so again be aware uh, law enforcement isn't going to call you and tell you that you know in order for a little johnny to get out of jail tonight you have to wire transfer or gift card transfer or crypto currency to them. That's not how it works. Uh, most usually, if in our in, uh, processes and policies, if we arrest somebody and we take them to Medina County Jail for whatever crime, uh, a person would have to go to Medina Municipal Court or Medina City Police Department and pay in person for whatever bail. Never does it ever occur over the phone. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, my next one, is um, revolving, it involves checks. And we've had a lot of this lately. Um, and I can't stress enough to the <laughs> residents of Hinkley Township, if you still mail a check to utility providers or uh, union associations or any, if you put a <laughs> check in the mail and it's to a, a local business or, or even a business across the country, I need you to watch those checks because what we're finding is somehow, some way, thieves are actually getting a hold of your check, your physical check. They're intercepting it and then they're duplicating it. The problem is they're changing to, to who it was paid for and what the amount um, of the check is. Um, and in most cases, when this occurs, 
uh, a homeowner or a resident doesn't even know it until you know maybe two or three months later, and uh, they get a notice from that business or that provider that you know you, you you're two months behind on whatever bill, and the difficulty in that is the longer it takes for you to discover those items are, are fraudulent, the more difficult it is for me as an investigator to go figure out who actually did it. Um, it I'm not saying that it's impossible because I've got plenty of ATM of uh, videos of people stealing your checks and then going to the ATM and depositing them and I can track them. It's just, it, it's a cumbersome process and it takes a little bit longer for you to get your money back from the bank for a fraudulent check. Um, and then uh, one of my most recent scams was I had a resident call me and tell me that um, <clears throat> he had seen a golf cart for sale on Facebook Marketplace. And he was interested in the golf cart. So he contacted the seller via Facebook message. And the seller said, ask him for his um, zip code. So he gave him his zip code. And the uh, seller, scammer, came back with, oh, well, I live in Hinkley, and I'm just down the street from you at such and such address. And I need you to, if you want to buy it, give me a $250 deposit via Venmo or uh, Zelle or Cash App. And if you use any of those uh, forms of payment, again, it's kind of like the gift card. Once you send it, it's gone. Um, it's very, very difficult to get that money back because it's initiated, you initiated on your bank, uh, your banking app. So um, he's like, no, I'm just down the street. I'm going to come and I want to take a look at it before I give you any kind of deposit. So he gets in his car, he drives down the street, pulls in the driveway. There's a for sale sign in the house. So far, everything matches and lines up uh, because, you know, the, the seller was selling this golf cart because they're moving out of state. Um, walks up to the door, knocks on the door, and the woman answers the door and she goes, I don't have a golf cart for sale. I don't know what you're talking about. Turns out it was a scam. When he mentioned it to me, I went on Facebook and I looked and there were probably 100, 150 ads in different cities across the, the country with that same picture of that same golf cart by that same seller. <clears throat> so he was doing that to a bunch of different people. Um, fortunately for us, uh, that incident didn't wind up in a loss because he didn't actually use the, the Venmo cash app or, or um, a Zelle transfer. Um, and then one of the last ones that, that I put in here is something that just was completely built bewildering to me. So I had a resident who was a juvenile who had a uh, expensive pair of shoes and he listed them on some online site for sale and somebody from Texas said, hey, I want those shoes. Um, and apparently this is a thing that I didn't know about, but you, uh, in order to stop um, copycat knockoff, things like that, you send the shoes to the, to the buyer, and then once he determines that they're real, they're not knockoffs, he then pays you. Well, in this case, the problem was um, this scammer was actually pretty quick, and he was buying from multiple different people. And um, he set it up so he had a pair of shoes from Ohio sent to Texas. And the guy in Texas who received the shoes was expecting them to come from someone else. And so the, the kid lost his money. And it was like 250 bucks. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a scam that's developing. And there's a number of ways that that one can go. So my suggestion and my recommendation is don't send anything out unless you've already got cash in hand for it. And that's all I have. Joe, sure, thank you. Uh, next is Brennan Long. Um, Brennan is currently a licensed private investigator in the state of Ohio. He's got over 25 years in law enforcement intelligence between the Phoenix Police Department, the FBI, and Department of Defense. He's worked <laughs> numerous violations in big cases involving gangs, violent crime, white collar crime, terrorism, and counterintelligence, and he's a 25 year retired Navy Reserve Intelligence Officer. Thank you, Chief. Right, it's I, I tend to walk around and I don't have a mic, so I'm tethered. We're yeah. tethered today. All right. All right, so I'll stay close, hopefully folks can uh, hear me okay next time, please. 
So Detective Kinney went over quite a few things, quite a uh, number of examples. I'm just going to give a broad brush on some more of those techniques. And then the other two gentlemen following up with me are going to provide some more specifics. So we talked about the telephone scam, getting a call from the government, uh, from a utility company, I'm in jail, please bail me out. Uh, what I find a little bit creepy um, is that the criminals are going to the next step. They're going to another level with this. They are actually, who has social media in the room? And I've got a number of folks, I see hands. Is it locked down or is it is it private? You know, and I know if I'm on Zoom audience, I'm sure there's a number of folks that have social media. Who posts videos, family events, right? And what these individuals are doing is they're going into a public account. I've posted stuff on Facebook. They're finding a video of a party, perhaps. They see a young, young teenager, maybe someone in their 20s who's on that video. They are actually pulling out that voice and they are creating a script from that person's voice using AI. And then they are making that call. So it actually sounds like your loved one. So as I go through these slides, I want to emphasize a couple different things. And the first thing we're gonna emphasize, everybody with me, slow down. Let's say, it. Slow, slow down. down. You get the call, mentally you're panicking, slow down. So we're gonna emphasize some of these things. Slow down, the caller won't get off the phone. They may even make threats. It's from a grandchild or a loved one that's in jail. We start to panic. I gotta help this person right away. Slow down. They start to ask for money as cash, gift cards, wire transfers, cryptocurrency. Slow down. The second thing I wanna verify or I wanna emphasize, verify. So two things we're gonna walk away from today. Slow down and verify. So everybody, verify. Verify. All right, next slide. So the government imposter, Detective Kenny already talked about this. You get a call, it might actually come up on your screen. Medicare, IRS, Social Security, you're in trouble. It's a Department of Justice, you owe a bunch of money, it's the IRS, you owe back taxes. So you panic. And what do I do? And they say, hey, I want you to go get gift cards and stay on the phone while I go to Walmart and purchase gift cards. Folks, what are we going to do? Slow down and verify. Right? Next slide. False investments. What's the saying? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Right? Too good to be true. I get someone that calls. I get an email that says, I've got this great investment. And if you just dump all this money into it, you're going to get a huge return. And you invest and invest and invest, and then suddenly you can't withdraw anything. Suddenly your money's gone. You can't get a hold of that person anymore. So what do we have to do? Slow down and verify, right? Next slide. Show of hands, who's ever been in love? Come on, <laughs> the whole room, the whole room, right? When we start to get in love, it's exciting. You know, everybody who's been lonely. Yes. And if I'm lonely and I'm going to put myself in a position of I'm 85 years old, I live alone, I've lost a spouse, I've gone through a divorce, I'm feeling down, someone reaches out to me, I start a conversation. What do we do? We get that adrenaline going, we get excited. And you love to hear from that person. And they pull you in. And then suddenly you say, hey, what do you do for a living? Hey, I've got this great uh, investment that we can get involved in. So you believe. You've got this passion going on. You're excited. You start to get involved. You start to send a little bit of money. And before you know it, you've sent a lot of money and you're not getting anything in return. And then suddenly they stop communicating. So what do we need to do? Everybody, slow down, verify. Okay, next slide. 
So I, I believe the gentleman at the end is going to touch on this a little bit. Uh, this is coming through the internet, through your emails. You click on a link, it takes you to another link that's a fake website, fake emails. Hey, you've got a delivery, click here. You've got a late delivery. Um, I think if I pulled up my account today, you probably have 10 of these sitting in your email. Um, I, this is for an example from PayPal. Hey, uh, you got a, a late payment. Click here, make your payment. What are we gonna do? Slow down, verify. How do you verify? Anybody? I got one of those, I even have PayPal. Yes. Oh, I knew it was. <laughs> right, and, and, and that's a good, good example. How do you know it's fake? When you start to look at some of this, read it. You'll see the grammar isn't correct. You'll see some weird characters. You know that's not from PayPal. If you get something like this, slow down. How do you verify? Stop. Go directly to whatever entity it is that they claim to be. Go the route you normally pay your bills. Verify. Call. Do whatever you need to do. Slow down. Nothing is so immediate that it has to be done within minutes. Slow down. I got this from PayPal. Let me get on the PayPal website. Let me call customer service. Let me verify. If the IRS called, hang up the phone, call the IRS. If the Department of Justice sends you an email, slow down, call the Department of Justice and verify. Next slide. Okay. So I started to get into this about a year ago, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Anybody in the room in cryptocurrency? Okay, okay. we've got one. Um, it is becoming more and more popular for not only scams, but also you're going to start seeing more digital assets. You're going to start seeing more digital currency. What I want you to do if you're involved in cryptocurrency is again, slow down and verify. Verify the information before you start transferring money into this world, okay? There are businesses that do nothing but evaluate the risk on investments. Take the time, find a reputable company and verify before you invest. And you can do that. They will track all of this information and verify before you start throwing money into cryptocurrency. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So this is what's going to take place. These are steps to take if you're a victim of fraud. First, you're going to call local law enforcement. They're going to come out. They're going to take a report. And they're going to do everything they can possibly do at a local level. But at the same time, these two websites, ic3.gov, report fraud uh, at the FTC, file a complaint in these websites, especially IC3. Go into IC3, there's a complaint form, fill out all the information you possibly can. What happens? You've notified the local law enforcement, You've also notified this is the federal government. The federal government takes that information. They will cut leads out to uh, the appropriate field offices, whether it's the FBI, IRS, Secret Service, and they will have the information that they can also start to look into your case. Yes. What is Question. IC3? IC3.gov. It's uh, internet complaints oh. for the uh, federal government. Yes. And so, uh, again, this is a basically a database for the federal government to collect that information. It then goes out to the local field office so they can follow up. OK, if you call the FBI, this is exactly what they're going to tell you. Please get an IC3.gov and file a complaint there. Call local law enforcement to also file that report. OK, now, Detective Kinney talked about a little bit. Uh, hit on it. These other two gentlemen are going to hit it. Hit on it as well. 
If you get involved in something like this, again, what are we gonna do? Slow down, verify. However, if you're a victim, it, it's very difficult if this information or your assets go overseas to prosecute somebody. It's very difficult. And it gets to a point where no matter what level of law enforcement's involved, there's a lot of steps uh, to take to find one, your assets that you have invested in, and two, prosecute someone for this crime. A lot of this is going overseas. A lot of it, you know, as I look at cases and they go to someone in Laos, we're not going to, as a government, go after to try to find somebody in Laos. We will try, the government will try to get your assets back, whether that's real money, whether that's uh, an investment, uh, whether or not that's cryptocurrency, but no, it is very, very difficult to get that back. And the, the prosecutor will go over that. But just keep that in mind. This is $3 million that I'm going to invest. So what do I need to do? Slow down and verify, okay? So thank you. Thank you. Next up is John Jaroska. John uh, has been in computers since uh, he was age seven, I believe. Yep. Um, he's got an, a business IT security company out of the city of Medina. John, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, so as you said, my name is John Jaroska. I own uh, Galaxy Software Solutions and IT Done For You, cybersecurity company. And today we're gonna talk about phishing, specific, specific ways that criminals can catch you. Um, so, it's likely you've heard what this is, but let's just talk about it, right? Because it's something you need to know how it works in order to avoid it, right? So uh, we want to, we call it fishing because criminals will throw out bait, just like a fisherman will throw out a fishing hook to catch a fish. A criminal will throw out uh, a digital bait in the form of email, right? Big juicy worm, right? And when you get this email, like Brennan said, it's going to look real. Amazon, Microsoft, eBay, PayPal, the, the, the list is endless. Um, and basically, once you're enticed into that email, that's a way that they can get your credentials, your username and your password, and then they're in, right? Uh, it's not just an inconvenient thing that we experience, right? Once you get into this thing, it's very difficult and costly uh, to get out of it, identity theft, right? So the most important thing is you want to avoid it in the first place. You don't want to be the victim after the fact, right? So it doesn't always come in the form of emails either. Well, we're going to touch on that a little later. Next slide, please. So if, if what you've heard already today didn't scare you, I'm not going to help you, okay? Last year, 83% of businesses reported experiences in phishing attacks, and it's up 30% from the year before. So it's like on an uptrend, big, big time. Uh, one in 100 emails that we get today are going to be a phishing attack, and 25% 25, 25 of those slip through firewalls and security filters, okay? There's going to be an additional 6 billion, with a B, attacks this year, okay? And 60% of those result in complete loss of either finances or data, emails, whatever it is, your, your whole computer possibly. Um, a third of those phishing emails actually just, they get opened because you're just reading your email. 52% um, of those result in uh, you giving away your login credentials. 90% of those data breaches occur because of this, because of getting emails, okay? And about 50% of them lead to something called ransomware, where the attacker actually gets in and installs something on your device, and they hold it hostage until you pay them, okay? Next slide, please. So what does it look like, right? The email comes in. You get up in the morning, you get your coffee, you're scrolling down through your inbox, you see it. It looks like it's being sent from someone you might know very close to you, okay? The, dangerous is, the danger is, um, like I said, 
And Brenda said, PayPal or Amazon, big companies. It looks just like that, okay? But in some cases, like you've heard, they'll know specific information about you because they've trolled your social profile, okay? Which makes it that much more believable and dangerous, okay? Now, it won't look suspicious, but then if you look close, you can start to question the content, right? It'll come with urgency. Slow down and verify. We've heard this. We know what to do, right? It's maybe asking you to confirm some details about a recent purchase you've made, okay? By doing this, by clicking or by engaging in it, you're opening up your device to this malware. And if it's inside your home, you can pass that malware to other devices in your home, your kids, your wife, et cetera. Now, another common approach is they'll ask you to click the link. It's going to maybe take you to a page that looks like exactly like PayPal, and that's called a spoofing page. There you're going to put in your credentials because you think it's real, and now they've got you. Next slide, please. Now, is it always an email? Sadly, it's not. Okay, and I'm going to go through and touch on a bunch of these. Pop-up phishing, you're surfing the web, something pops up on your browser, uh, your computer needs maintenance, it's slow and we'd like to help you out. Click this link if you'd like our help. They install their piece of software or they lead you to a credit card site, okay? Evil twin, you go into Starbucks, this is a very scary one, you go into Starbucks or Dunkin' and you want to get onto their public Wi-Fi. And you see the Wi-Fi, and instead of Starbucks, it's Starbuck dollar sign. You connect to it, expecting to get to the internet, and now you're connected, connected directly to the criminal, and he's got you. Angler phishing. Social media posts are created uh, with special elixirs. Eat a banana every day for diabetes. You click on it, and no banana in the world is going to cure diabetes. You're hooked. Vishing with a V, okay? It's done through your phone. Someone will call you and ask for a code, ask for your zip code, a representative, and you'll give them remote access to uh, your computer through going to their website. <clears throat> Spoofing is exactly that, a website that is created to trick you into believing you're going to the real thing. Smishing, this is my favorite, smishing. It's phishing over an SMS text message to your phone saying for you to come in and vote for a candidate in the upcoming election. And then domain spoofing is the genuine web addresses like PayPal with a one at the end. Okay, you click on it and it goes and it, and it gets you. Next slide, please. Couple more here, whaling. This is specifically to business owners that are executives in the company that may have a little bit more power over the whole domain of their company and they're targeting those executive positions to get access. And man in the middle. The criminal assumes and gets in the middle of an email chain or thread with a conversation between you and another person that you already trust, and now they've got you. Next slide, please. So who's at risk? We're all at risk. I, I specialize in small to medium-sized businesses, but every single one of us has email, has a text message, has a phone, we're at risk, okay? So some examples, really scary, right? 2013, 2015, Facebook and Google scammed out of $100 million, right? Because uh, this, they do business with the same Taiwanese company and someone impersonated that company and sent them invoices and Facebook and Google paid them. Luckily, they were able to get half that money back, $50 million, okay? Sony Pictures, super secret about uh, movies and details. It wasn't about money. The scammers got in there and sent email conversations about staff members and scripts of upcoming movies. It cost Sony $35 million to repair those leaks and gaps, okay? So it's serious. So how can we stay protected? We've heard a few things, right? So, Number one, and that's why we're here today, education, right? You're here to learn about what's happening and how to prevent, okay? Everyone's at risk, no one's safe. So any device, be it your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your PC, 
anything, any one of these devices can be gotten into if you're not paying attention, right? It could be phishing or any one of other forms we talked about today, right? Now, let's get into specifics. Misspelled words, websites, email addresses that are just off by one character, .co instead of .com or .io, uh, oddly named attachments like register or invoicing or something like that. Who the email is addressed to? It might be even addressed to you, but there might be a small misspelling there. Poor grammar or missing punctuations, extra commas, different things like that. Unusual layout, maybe the logo of PayPal is shifted over a little bit, and that just doesn't jive with you. Next slide. So here's specifically actions you can go home today, go to your email, and look at these things and, and educate yourself on stuff right in your email. Do hover your cursor over the email to look for the links. If they're very huge, they look suspicious, they don't go to the website you're expecting, that's a surefire way to tell that that's a scam. Delete. Don't log into any one of your accounts following a link by your email. We've heard Brennan say that. Always go directly to the site and log in to be sure. Do check all your emails to make sure they're genuine, even if they're from your friends, colleagues, or family. Do not, most importantly, use the same password, username and password, for multiple sites, banking, Facebook, PayPal, eBay, Microsoft, Amazon, the whole bit. Do not use the same password. Uh, use a password manager to help you <clears throat> randomize all this stuff and keep track of it for you. Implement multi-factor authentication. It's getting a little techy, but when you log into a website, it sends you a code to validate it is you, let me in. If you often deal with financial transactions, it's a good idea to set up a separate email just for logging into your bank account. You can do stuff like that. The other way you can avoid financial mishap, don't do online banking. If you don't feel safe doing online banking, just go to the bank and deposit your check, okay? Um, that's all I have today. If you have any questions, I've got some cards and we'll have a question and answer at the end. Thank you. Next up Thank you. is Brian McDonough. Uh, Brian <laughs> is an assistant United States attorney for the North District of Ohio in the Criminal Division's White Collar Crimes Unit. Um, he has extensive experience in investigating these types of crimes and prosecuting criminals. He's been on a number of TV shows highlighting his, the cases he's done. And Brian? All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian McDonough, and my fancy title is Assisted United States Attorney, uh, but that's just short for being a federal prosecutor. Um, what I'm about to tell you is going to save you, a family member, a friend, a colleague, about $1,600. And that's because that is the average loss when it comes to a scam, according to the Federal Trade Commission in Northern Ohio. Uh, for federal purposes, the definition of being an elder is 60 years of age or older, and the federal government considers you an elder. I serve as elder justice coordinator for our office, which means I have the pleasure of working with our federal law enforcement partners like the FBI, Secret Service, United States Postal Inspection Service, as well as our state and local law enforcement like Detective Kinney here in Hinckley and others, and to investigate and prosecute cases of scams, fraud. And my area is for those that are 60 years of age or older. Now, if there is a fire at your house in Hinckley, who do you call? Well, the fire department, 911. What if it's three houses down from your house? Who are you gonna call? I'll still call them. Fire department, if I see a fire in three houses. What if you're in a subdivision and there's one way at the end of the subdivision, who are you going to call? Same thing, because as a community, uh, we are all invested in this. And sadly, we cannot arrest our way, 
prosecute and or, or indict our way out of it. So on the federal level, what we do is we take a two-step approach. One is offense, one is defense. On the offensive side, yes, we investigate, we prosecute, we indict. But on the defensive side, it's outreach and education uh, so that you'll be aware uh, of what's going on. And the, the great thing about you being here today on a Saturday morning is that out of 44 cases of scams involving the elderly, do you know how many actually get reported? One. One out of 44. Why? A lot of folks feel shame. They feel they got duped. They feel embarrassment. We heard about that grandparent scam, okay? The only thing about a grandparent scam that a victim is guilty of is of loving your grandchild. Because you get that call and you're thinking, oh my goodness, they've been in an accident. They've hit a pregnant woman. They, if they're in college, there's, there, there's a gag order on the proceeding and you, they need $10,000 bond money now. Can you help? And most folks will, I will believe that it is there. Oh, there's the call. There it is. There it is. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. They'll think it's their grandchild. Normally it'll be grandma, grandpa. And if, if you don't recognize it, they might say, oh, I broke my nose. I broke my nose. And, and then they'll pass the phone to a police officer, a lawyer, a bondsman. And the idea is this sense of urgency on it. So I had an opportunity to investigate two men from the state of Florida that came up to Northeast Ohio. And in five weeks, they made $383,000 on the grandparent scam. They would go ahead and they would call uh, it, or have someone else call. And those call centers can be from Canada, Jamaica, India, Costa Rica. Uh, all the information is available. We have, there's data lists where you can go to a data broker and say, hey, give me a list of everybody in Hinckley uh, who is over the age of 60. Why do the criminals target the folks over the age of 60? Why would that be? What it tells us is actually between someone who's 60 and someone who's 26, who's better at spotting a scam? The older one, you're absolutely right. Your life experience serves you well, okay? However, when the person who's 60 ends up getting scammed, the loss amount is much greater. That 26 year old might be out $150. The 60 year old might be out 1600 as a result on that part. Uh, so what these guys did was they would drive around and, and just like the courier method being used is they were told uh, we need $10,000. Some folks actually had it at home. They had some house money and they were told a courier will come to their house. They'll give the cash and, and that's it. They're thinking they're helping their grandson or granddaughter. In other cases, they were told, told to go to your local bank. Go to your bank, make a cash withdrawal. If asked by the teller, tell them it's for home improvement. Tell them it's for a construction project. Tell them it's for something else. Don't tell them. Be secret. Be secret about it. And sadly, some of the banks would go ahead and, and, and give folks that, that cash, uh, and then the, the, the couriers would come by. What we were able to do is we were able to link them all together. And Brennan talked about that IC3.gov. It's the Internet Crime Complaint Center. And when what you can do is you can make a report on there. You can have a family member make a report. And what that will do is all the information about the crime is listed on there. And that gets put into a big database. And then what we're able to do is we're able to link it together. So instead of the crime just happening in Hinckley, in the case of the grandparent scam, I was able to link Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, and link them all together. And then we're able to charge it here in Cleveland. Uh, for our office, which is the United States Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Ohio, we cover the Northern 40 counties in Ohio. There's about six and a half million people, and we're going after the worst of the worst. Uh, when it comes to most of the scams, there's really the two varieties. We've talked a lot about the one variety and that's the stranger. The best advice that you ever received from your parents or your grandparents you had when you were five or six years old 
And you know what they told you? They told you four words. And those words will continue to serve you well. Don't talk to strangers. Those four words are, are terrific. Uh, we've had scammers that attempt to contact you by phone. Everybody answers the phone. Everyone answers the phone. What we find in investigating the cases has been discussed, the scammers can make that call look like it's coming from anywhere. They can make that, that cell phone appear that it's a, uh, coming from the Hinckley Police Department. They can make it look like it's from anywhere. What we found, most of them are using cell phone companies in Canada that are using those that are difficult to, difficult to trace. Uh, but we are able to get some of those on that part. Uh, also, the robocalls. You'll get those robocalls. Uh, there's been some legislation to stop that. But the best advice to do is not to answer the robocall. My dad, who's 79, he'd like to have fun with it. He'd answer the call and say, Allo, what? What you want? Olga, get the book, the English book. I mean, he'd keep his callers on the line. I said, Dad, don't do that. When you answer the call, you're, you're confirming that, that there's a live person on the end. So the best thing to do is not to answer any of those calls. What, so what if it's an emergency? Have them leave a voicemail. Leave a voicemail and they'll be able to get back to you. Uh, uh, John talked about on the emails on there, yes. You never click on a link. You never click on an attachment. Uh, passwords are important. When my dad had to have his first password, it had to be four letters and he picked food as a password because he liked food. Then it had to go to eight letters. So he picked food, food as his password. <laughs> and he saved that for everything. Well, once your, your password, there's a data breach. Once your password gets hacked, the scammers can try various accounts on that part. And imagine your email. My wife keeps a very tidy house. And in her email account through Gmail, through Google, she probably has four emails. Me, on the other hand, I'm a pack rat. I save everything. I probably have 10,000 emails in my Gmail account. What do you have in yours? If someone got into your personal email, what would they learn about you? Where you shopped, where you banked, what your health condition was, what your family members, who they were on it. Those are all things to consider uh, to go ahead and be able to go ahead and, and uh, delete those and that. Uh, when it comes to uh, cryptocurrency, as, as, as Jeff mentioned and, and Brennan mentioned on that part, that is a vector change when it comes to crime, okay? When Dillinger was robbing banks in the 20s and 30s, if you were able to outrun the sheriff of uh, Summit County and you were able to make your way from Ohio to Indiana on, nice, on a fast car and asphalt roads, once they made it to the Indiana border, they were home free, okay? FBI gets created in the 30s to have that jurisdiction to cross state lines. These days, someone, instead of robbing a bank like Dillinger with a gun, they can go ahead and stay in their parents' basement and rob banks in all 50 states from the comfort of their basement, and they do uh, on that part. Uh, gift cards that were mentioned. Here's an easy rule. If someone's asking you to do something with a gift card, it's a scam. Okay, it's an absolute scam. No one is asking you for a gift card. We had one where a pastor uh, sent an email to a parishioner and the parishioner said, oh, we're doing outreach. We need uh, gift cards for the for homeless and for folks. As it turns out, she went ahead, sent the gift cards, took photos, sent the numbers. On Sunday, the pastor said, my email account got hacked. If you got an email from me, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a hacked email. She got upset at the grocery store where she bought the uh, gift cards. She bought $1,500 worth of gift cards. Grocery store has a, uh, uh, Heinen's was the grocery store. Heinen's then came out with signs and said, listen, if someone's asking you to go ahead and make a purchase of gift cards, the great advice that Brennan said, slow down and verify that on it. Uh, if you have a business on that part, uh, real estate transactions, someone sends an email. We had a church that were doing a project and they ended up changing their, uh, they said the vendor, the vendor changed their bank account information. Please wire funds to, to this account. It turns out that was, um, you know, that was all false. Well, how do we catch them? As, as Detective Guinea said, once that report gets filed with Hinkley, once it's on IC3.gov, then we work with our federal partners to go ahead and, and, and see on that uh, how to go ahead and how do we um, 
how do we uh, identify that? I just had a case where we had a fellow from the UK that we charged. It was a wine and whiskey investment fraud case where you would get a cold call saying you should diversify your investments. You know, fine wine gets better with age. Uh, go ahead and invest 5,000, hold on to it. You'll get a return of probably 20, 30%. Just diversify a little bit. And people were instructed to go ahead and pay and invest. And the whole thing turned out to be a scam, okay? You tried to sell your wine, they'd try to sell you to buy more wine. And then they switched from wine to whiskey and the same thing. Uh, so we had that on, on those parts. And those are, as I say, long-term ones regarding that. If you have a mailbox, and you have a little red flag on your mailbox, don't use it. That's a sign for any criminal to say, hey, there's a check in that mailbox. Uh, I indicted for the Secret Service 18 cases in the last two years of check fraud rings that went up to mailboxes and would go ahead and steal those checks. And as Detective Kinney said, you go ahead, you wash the check, you call the bank, you find out how much is in the account, and you alter the check. There are apps now on phones where you can actually deposit the check without even going into the bank on it. We were able to identify those rings. If you do have to mail a check, I would even advise you, don't go to the blue box at the post office. I would say walk into the post office and hand your check to that letter carrier there on it. Uh, we've had cases where the blue boxes outside of post offices have been compromised and those have been used to go ahead by gangs to steal. Uh, they used to be able to take a belt, put some duct tape on it and go fishing, fishing inside the, to go ahead and steal mail. Now they're getting keys to go ahead and, and wholesale, go ahead and do that. Um, if you've got, if you get robocalls at home on a landline, check with your provider to see what steps can be taken to reduce those. If you've got a cell phone, I don't like it. There are some apps that you can purchase that will go ahead and reduce those calls. More importantly, if you go ahead and visit a friend and you see that their phone is ringing off the hook, you know that that's something to go ahead and, and talk and, and report on that. Or if you go to a friend's house and they got a stack of mail and that they've won the lottery, I've won the Irish sweepstakes, I've won the Jamaican lottery, that those are instances of it. Uh, we use a lot of resources to prosecute those folks. I've been able to extradite uh, folks from Romania. And I've got active investigations with Nigeria and West Africa, India, uh, Costa Rica uh, regarding it. Um, what are some good resources for you? Elderjustice.gov, elderjustice.gov. That's the part of the Elder Justice Initiative for the United States Department of Justice. Also, identitytheft.gov. Those are, those are wonderful resources because what if your credit card gets stolen. What if that number, how could they steal my credit card when I have my credit card in my wallet and I've got that number? Uh, those are great resources to use to say, hey, if you got a scam through the phone, through an email, uh, if you got a scam through the mail, you can go ahead and there's a lot of overlapping federal, state and local resources available. The Ohio Attorney General's office has a wonderful uh, site for consumer protection as well. I uh, know we've given you a lot, a lot of information uh, when it comes to scams. Um, I, I do think the, the idea of not talking to strangers, taking the extra time to make a call, uh, and then just being on the lookout are all three good takeaways for you uh, to protect you, to educate you, and then to allow us to go ahead and catch the bad guys. Um, and we've had tremendous success in prosecuting those aggregating those together. And we've had sentences ranging from three years to 20 years for these cyber criminals who are really trying to steal generational wealth through being a, a bad actor. Uh, we can't do it alone. You are our eyes and ears. And thank you for coming out here today. In the spirit of getting this wrapped up somewhat timely, um, just remember, if you're a victim, immediately call your local law enforcement. Stop giving your money away. Contact your financial institutions, credit bureaus, and most importantly, tell your family and ask for help. What we see with a lot of senior folks is they're embarrassed. They don't want to tell their kids they were scanned, um, but it's important. Tell your, tell your family and get their help and guidance. You know, like I said before, sadly, with the development of technology, we are 
we're always a step behind these people. So look out for each other, look out for your family members, your moms and dads, your grandparents, your neighbors, um, just be there for each other. And if nothing, we get nothing for free in this world. So if it's too good to be true, that's what it is. So we will uh, thank you and we will take any questions you may have at this time. Just curious, the people from Florida? Yes. Earlier, when they were caught, yeah. What happened to them? Oh, that was great. So, yes. Yeah, so, what they were using, they were using U Haul trucks, which was very interesting on it. And the Westlake Police Department uh, was able to go ahead and put on a bolo, a be on the lookout. A lot of people had those little uh, video uh, doorbells and video cameras, and they were able to get a description, blasted it out across Northeast Ohio to be on the lookout. And then Cleveland's finest, they were able to see these, see the, the U-Haul truck, and once they got the U-Haul truck, we were able to, uh, um, one of them actually had a gun. We were able to go ahead and uh, 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 arrest both of those, and then the one guy on his cell phone, his cell phone was a treasure trove. It listed all the places they had been. They had stayed at a downtown hotel in Cleveland. They went to a downtown hotel. They had plane tickets of where they had flown and crisscrossed the United States. They would get paid about $1,500 a day to be these couriers to run around. And at the end of the day, they would take the cash and either FedEx it to an address, or they would take the cash and they would go ahead and, and put it onto a, uh, a card, a debit card. And then the, the other folks in the conspiracy were able to go ahead and obtain the funds off of that, that card. But I really believe of the cases we have, about 60% are international and 40% are domestic. So I do believe when we're talking a transnational organized crime that overseas someplace, every week they say, hey, how much did we get from Ohio this week? And they sit around a table and then that money can, can go absolutely anywhere on it. Um, uh, one of the scams, the, uh, the, the publisher's clearinghouse scam, where it's like, hey, you, 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 you didn't win the, the big prize, but you won third place on it. Uh, send $500 for an advance fee to get your 1.9 million or whatever. Uh, we trace those go to Jamaica. And in Jamaica, Jamaica is the size of Connecticut. They've got the highest homicide rate in the Western hemisphere. And with those funds that go to Jamaica are used for two things. The one is for public corruption. They actually buy corrupt politicians. And two, they purchase AK-47s, which are used by gangs as street sweepers. They have about 300 gangs down in Jamaica and those use those. So who would think that a, a fraud scheme would be used to finance public corruption and murder, but that happens in Jamaica. No. But the guys from Florida, the guys yeah. caught. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. They, they, Whatever, I mean, do they get a year? Oh no, they ended up getting under the federal guidelines. They both got 30, 33 months and 37 months in federal prison respectively based on that amount. Yep, yep. It's a white, white collar crime. No, it isn't. But. Uh, we, it takes them out of uh, commission for a while. Uh, when it comes to, when you think of state crimes, you've got murder, you've got rape, you've got, you've got gun crimes, violent on those. When we look at economic crimes, typically in the state system, those are more probationable offenses. They say, hey, you put them on probation, give them a chance to go ahead and, and pay it back for restitution, things like that. On our federal system, when it comes to white collar crimes, which are my bread and butter, it's you're going to prison. If we're charging you, you are going to prison. And so in the federal system where you normally you don't have the, the murders and things like that, those are more serious crimes. And then they're tagged. They're tagged in the system. We have them. If you're a repeat offender in the, in the federal system, you're going to go ahead and get, get more time on that. So it may not seem like a lot, like on that low end of three years, but when compared to other crimes, it's significant. Mr. Larson, I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the person in my family, most of these figures are still sleeping. Yeah. Um, but I guess my question was directed to Mr. Andrew. Can you tell me, is there value uh, in establishing a, a VPN, virtual private network, for your, for your computer activities at home? And if there is value, which one is a good one? That's the first part. Second is, what it really is the value. I, I use Apple Pay 
a lot, but I don't use it a lot to buy stuff with. I just use it as kind of a vector to make payments. In other words, like my spectrum bill. I'll tell spectrum to charge my Apple Pay. And if anything goes wrong, you know, Apple Pay takes care of it. So that's kind of a two-part question. Yeah, sure. Um, before before you answer that question, could I ask you to turn that microphone back around at you? Yeah. And could you just summarize Jim's question? Because the people who are zooming, the only way they can hear is through the microphone. I gotcha. Okay, so so if I understand what you asked, is there value in, in getting a VPN and, and maybe some recommendations around that? And then, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, Apple Pay. Apple Pay, yes. Okay, so is there value in having uh, Apple Pay or some other pay in the middle of transactions? So first of all, the VPN, absolutely a VPN will add an extra layer of privacy for you. So when you surf the internet, um, there's not as much information transmitting from you out there for those internet sites to scrape. Now, obviously, if you still click on something and you follow, uh, you're engaging. So, so that's not going to protect you from that standpoint. As far as best ones, there's dozens of them out there. I can, uh, if you stop by afterwards, I can, I can uh, get your email and, and I can send you a few of those. Uh, now, as far as the Apple Pay, uh, Google Wallet, uh, Samsung Pay, uh, there's lots of them. Um, typically, uh, banks will like so. It's the same conversation with debit cards and credit cards. Typically, an intermediary pay vendor will give you some added protection about, okay, we protect you up to $500 per transaction or $5,000 per whatever uh, within a certain date range. If you report within 30 days, uh, that sort of thing, it absolutely could give you an extra layer of protection. Uh, credit cards typically offer a little bit more and added features over using a debit card because debit cards are linked directly to your account, whereas a credit card is not. So I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Just on the debit card point, I would say we advise not to have debit cards. Debit cards are key. If you do want to have a debit card, link it to an account that does not have direct deposit. And that way you can limit your exposure there under debit cards. Uh, the you have 48 hours to go ahead and contest an unlawful charge with the banks on it. They're typically very good, but again, uh, the credit card offers superior protection in that you're able to go ahead and have 60 days to challenge charges on that. Um, so that's why we advise against having debit cards for that reason. Okay, mine's an email question. So you're allowed to open the email, right? Don't get the links, but I always kind of check who it's from and the from looks weird. But is that a good way to look? I mean, can they change that? But that's not even a legit way to see if it's a legit email. Yeah, the best advice uh, I believe John mentioned is to is on the from is to take your mouse and, and hover your mouse over that from so you can actually see it could say John Smith, but then if you hover, it'll say the exact uh, the exact email address, and that that's typically the the spam that you would get on it. And before, right, it is a good way to check it. And, and obviously, before doing any financial transaction, just being able to verify on that one. So if you got an email, even if though you think it's from someone you know telling you to do something, do one more step, do a phone call, just to verify on that, and that way you're you're protected on it. And to add to that. Yeah. You, you, if, if you know John Smith and it comes up as John Smith, but the email is cut off and you don't really pay attention to that all. It, it, his email could really be uh, John Smith at AOL.com. And this email is coming from John dot Smith at AOL.com. But you really can't see that little portion because maybe cut off uh, and you're just looking at the name. It's easily, easily fooled. Hover over it and that'll be the whole thing. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Just something you didn't touch on is uh, our, my mantra is don't click on anything. I don't care who it comes from. We didn't talk about attachments in a document. Those can be uh, open you up to expose you as well. Unless somebody specifically tells me that they're sending me such and such document, don't click on anything because that's going to send you down a dark road. Um, and I would like, is it safe to say that 
pretty much any federal agency isn't going to contact you by phone. They're going to, as far as financial, they're going to reach out to you. By <laughs> Correct. No one's going to call. The IRS is not going to call you telling that they're going to arrest you unless you go ahead. Um, same thing, immigration. The other aspect of it, which is different, what we've seen is, is similar. I don't know if it was Brennan or Jeff who mentioned it. Someone can say, we believe like, you know, your bank is corrupt. Your teller is corrupt. We're investigating them. And what they'll try to do is try to say that you, we need your assistance. And now you're working with the DEA or working with the FBI. So the scammers are now trying to say, hey, you're helping law enforcement to go ahead and withdraw the cash from your bank and convert it to a cryptocurrency through a Bitcoin ATM. And on those Bitcoin ATMs, there'll be a sign about warning about scam. And they'll say, don't worry about that because you're working with the you're working with the feds now. So that it doesn't apply to you on that part. For, give me your identification information. I'll contact you. Yes. Well. No one from the IRS is calling you. No one from any federal agency is going to call you. You're, you're going to get something in the mail. And then when you do get it, as they say, you can take that next step and go ahead and, and, and verify it yourself and go ahead and, you know, an in-person trip to Social Security, a call anywhere else to go ahead and, and verify that on. But you're right. No, no one's going to call and say, hey, you owe money go ahead and, and pay or use gift cards or do that. But they always have that sense of urgency. Something's getting shut off. Someone's getting arrested. Lien's going to be filed. Act now. And that's the part, I think, what Brendan's saying, that slow down part is so, so helpful. One, one last thing for, for credit cards. We, we do, as almost every one of them offers a notification for any charge that goes through, you can set it at whatever limit you want. Because a lot, when they do take a number, and they put a very low cost charge through to make sure it works. Yeah. My only advice on that one is if you have a spouse and in the interest of marital harmony, if you set that amount too low and you're able to see what your spouse charges, you may not have to bring up every single charge with your spouse on that part. But yes, it's very helpful. Mine's, mine's set at a penny. It is. Yes. No. Yeah, I would even say, and I, and I know these gentlemen don't mind, um, if you get a call from the Department of Justice saying, hey, you owe money stop, hang up, call the Hinckley Police Department and say, hey, I just got a call from the Department of Justice. Can you guys help me out in verifying this? And I know without a doubt, I've spoken to all of these guys in the room, they would be more than happy to follow up with you to get that verified. So, so the one that Jeff had touched on about the Department of Justice called and wanted to put the money in the box. Yeah. He went to the bank. And the teller did what she was supposed to do and questioned him. And he said, hey, the guy had told him that, that they're going to ask you at the bank and you tell them yeah. for a remodel. And she did. And he felt so horrible lying to the teller yeah. that if she had called us, yeah. we would have easily convinced him not to because he did not want to lie to the teller. Yeah. Yeah, on that. The, yeah. the other thing that I'm going to throw in here when we're talking about um, these agencies calling you and telling you, you know, you got to you call me back on this 800 number and such and such with, with your gift card or with your crypto, whatever. Um, every company you deal with, every government agency, they all have 800 toll free numbers. A scammer is going to give you an 800 toll free number, but it's going to be not to that same 800 number that's associated with the IRS. So instead of dialing the number that that person on the phone gives you, maybe get their operator ID or their, their employee ID, and then go on the website for irs.gov, dial that 800 number that is on that, that real website for the federal government, Dial that number, and when somebody answers, say, I spoke to John Smith, and his employee ID is such and such, and he told me that I needed to do such and such. They're going to, at that point, confirm for you, number one, that the phone number that he gave you is not legit, is not real, and the whole thing is a scam, and it's going to save you the, the, the agony and the pain of being, becoming a victim of one of these crimes. It, it works with the utility companies as well. And the only sad part is this is that once someone becomes a victim of a scam, your name, address, and phone number go on a list. 
They call it the losers list. And that will get circulated on the web to other scammers. They will come back a second time and say, hey, remember you got the, uh, this, the scam involving you taking money from the bank? Well, guess what? We caught the scammer. Interpol got him at Scotland Yard. We're going to extradite him, but all we need to extradite him is $1,500 to pay for extradition. They have a playbook that they use that is so, so good. In fact, on some of them, we've had it where the family members had to cut off communication and say, hey, mom, dad, no more cell phone. And the scammers will FedEx a new cell phone in 48 hours to keep the communication going, to go ahead and keep that on it. Uh, my dad was changing cable providers. He was worried about his, his photos, family photos. So he Googled what he thought was from Spectrum to Cox or whatever. And uh, he was wondering, and the guy said, oh, sir, we can go ahead and, and, and I can help you with that. And he ended up giving the guy remote access to his computer. And that helpful fellow found a virus and said, you know what, if you'd like, I can delete this virus. It only cost $99. And so my dad took his credit card, read off the number. The guy did that. Guy kept looking and said, oh, you know what? I found another virus for a year of protection. It only costs $299. And at that point, that's when my dad thought, oh, goodness, I've just been, been scammed. What do you do? So again, thank goodness he called me that you call the credit card company, you cancel the card, you can place a fraud alert, you do all those things, you report it. Because again, these guys are so, so good, and it's going to take all of us to go ahead and, uh, and defeat that. Yeah. One other one I, I want to throw out there. Any emails from a stranded military member overseas, delete, just delete. There is no one in the military that's going to be stranded overseas and needs money to get home. It's, it's impossible. Just delete. Don't even read it. Just delete it. Okay. Yeah. The, those romance scams. Number one target is a woman over the age of 50 who's single. And these guys do a long-term con where they say, I'm building an orphanage in Egypt. The, kid, the sand is hot. Could you send $5 so the orphans can have shoes? And you think, hey, that sounds good. I'll send $5. And then we're building the orphanage. I need a permit. My funds are frozen. Can you send 50 bucks? And then the contractor, the wall ends up falling on the worker. And in Egypt, that's a, you know, that's a, a criminal offense. Can you send bond money? Can you do this? And they string it out. So it starts with $5. And at the end of the day, we've had cases where someone has sent up to a million dollars thinking that it's someone who needs help. And, uh, you know, the idea of how old were you when you fell in love? If you were 16, great. But now if you're 56 and now you've got means and someone is communicating with you and you say, so if you have a friend who says, hey, I found a love interest online. I went on, you know, Facebook or I want a plenty of fish or I went on, you know, our time. Those guys are searching and contacting and they've got, they've got lines that they use. Loveletters.com. If you ever get in trouble, if you're ever in the doghouse and you need a line, you can use one of these <laughs> saying my heart skipped a beat when I saw your email. You know, I, I love, you know, and they go on and on and on. And, and, and this person's promising walks on the beach and romantic dinners, and then family members are saying, hey, that's a scam. Well, if you had to pick, which one would you pick? Romantic, romantic walks on the beach or the fact that this person does not exist? It's kind of like that golf cart. That, go that same one is being used over and over and over again because part of the brain that controls love has a tendency to uh, control over all or other rational thought. But uh, yeah, it, it never ends. And it will continue, as they say, as folks are lonely or looking for love. It, uh, yeah, it will not end. Um, on Facebook Marketplace, um, I don't know if I'm buying or selling, but a couple of times now they've asked the buyer or whatever to say, uh, give me the code so I can confirm that who you really are. And they're asking for some code. And I'm like, what the heck is this code? That's a scam. So what yeah, so, so what happens is um, what they're doing is they're they're at when when you log on to Facebook, it's going to want to ask you for that multi-factor authentication, and they'll I've had them even say, "Hey, I'm going to text you a code 
would you please confirm, give me the code so I can confirm it's really you, yeah. when in reality, they're trying to gain access to your account and they're sending the code to your phone. And once you send them the code, they poke it in and now they're in. Yeah. Uh, I've had the same experience. Um, I sold something on Marketplace and they asked for your phone number. Ah created a whole new, and the next person that came and bought the item was an officer. So I told him about it and he had never heard about it yet, a couple of years ago, but they take your phone number. They actually create a phone number through, um, through my phone system. Like they created a new number that's similar to my number and off they went. But there's nothing you can do about it because they're already done, you know, gone. Yeah. But never, and I hadn't been on social media forever, but now I'm quite popular with the men um, that are <laughs> creating. I get messages from all over, and this is recently. And I'm like, oh, you're such a nice looking man. I yeah. can respond, but you know that's not the person. I just delete them. But it seems to be happening a little more. So now I'm skeptical what do i do do i delete everything start over i told my wife i said listen i've never been more popular than i ever have now look at i got ladies all over the world that want to connect with me on here yeah i would delete everything on on that part on it yeah. absolutely you're going to get text messages you're gonna, it's spam um the, the latest one with the uh, romance is they want you to invest in real estate and so convert your money to that atm and there's great land in California or a bridge in New York you can buy and all that. And it's all, once that money's gone, it, it, it's gone, it's gone on that part. So, yeah. And I'll, I'll say that, you know, we're talking a lot of times we talk about elder fraud, but in the cryptocurrency world, what I have noticed is they're not elders that are being victimized. They're middle-aged folks that have a lot of money and believe and are duped into seeing actual websites that track progress. They see returns. They see, oh, I'm making a million dollars. I made $3 million. And then when it's time to start to get that asset out, well, you need to pay taxes. So send us $15,000 to pay the taxes. And you're just now dumping something into what is a fake website in the cryptocurrency world. So it's not just elders that are being scammed. Just be cognizant that it's a whole new world with that cryptocurrency. It's extreme and it's coming. I have a question on that. Um, I have a friend that just recently moved with her job to Montana mm -hmm. with the IRS. Said, Nancy, I met with these people. One guy's into cryptocurrency and wants me to invest. Yeah. I'm like, are you crazy? Yes. You know, yeah. um, yes. are they working socially, like in a in a group setting and saying, hey, I've actually got this one? It, it, it it's like pretty advanced. Well. And you will even get networks that originate overseas, but they may even have people that they have legitimately, what these people think, have hired here. Yeah. to be the face of that company. And the whole thing is a scam. Right. So it's if you're going to invest, I don't care what it is. If you're going to invest, take the time to get with a reputable risk company that you trust to verify this is a, a legitimate investment right. before you, you start dumping money into it. Yeah, my father had a bunch of different accounts, Venmo, PayPal. I said, do you really need all these accounts? Does that, will that really help you on it? Anything in, I got cryptocurrency because that's how, what, that's what the criminals use. It's anonymous. And so I wanted to know how it worked, but anything you put in, you might as well consider it, hey, it's lost, you know, on that part of it. But even with online banking on that, I'm glad my aunt made a uh, purchase at Chico's. She's like, I'm going to try this online uh, bill payment. So instead of paying $67, she, she missed the decimal point and did $6,700 to Chico's. And it went through, came right out of her checking account. Her husband, my uncle, was at the bank and said, did you just do shopping? 
we're, we're in the negative, what happened? And it took a while for them to undo the charge, but just because the technology is there, um, you know, do you really need to use all those methods on it? Do you really need to do that? So kind of be judicious in what you use and how you use it. Yeah. Mr. Park, any issue allowing someone to scan your driver's license? How so? Is it at the checkout? At the at, Oh, that's fine. It, it, there's a lot of organized retail crime fraud when it comes to that on it, that we've prosecuted folks for, they make counterfeit coupons, they defraud the major carriers, they travel in groups, it's organized crime, something like that, yeah. What does Home Depot do with that information? <sighs> no, they're trying to... Probably they're just very... Uh, just probably verify who it is on it on it you've got a lot of theft and things like that now granted again when home depot got breached they got breached because they had a contractor who got breached so again the idea of having your uh, annual credit report which you can get for free from transunion experian equifax you can stagger that every four months and get a free credit report you can also put a credit freeze so no one's able to go ahead and open up accounts in your name or use your credit but if it's, a, as you say, a major retailer like that and they want to scan my credit card, go right ahead. I don't have any concerns on that. And are there any devices that can read the information on the credit cards in my wallet? Oh, RFID on those? Yeah, they have them. That, uh, you can scan. There's a, devices that can go ahead and do that. I know you can get a, go ahead and get some special wallets and some things like that on it. I would think on some of those, like travel, the touristy cities, uh, high volume, things like that. I think the idea of the bank alerts is great. You can set your bank alert and you'll get a notification on your phone. If it's oh, set your threshold over a certain purchase, that's a great way to do. Probably the best thing to do for your wallet, take everything out of your wallet, make a copy of the front and back of all your cards. Take that piece of paper, put it in a spot at your house. So in the event that you lost your wallet or something happened, you can easily call all those numbers and say, hey, cancel my card, get a new one. Anyone else? John. Question for you. Um, this has happened several times. Um, specifically, I'm just going to use our fire department for an example. The association has a Facebook page that several times now we've had, you know, someone claiming to be selling t-shirts. Um, and they tag a bunch of people in it. You know, I, I know I've been tagged in it several times. Is there any way to, and we know it's a scam, right? So they just send out an alert saying, hey, we're not selling t-shirts. But is there a way to prevent that from happening on a page like that? So I would I would say the first and foremost thing is go ahead and change the password immediately on the account. Um, the second thing is on the- I'm sorry, they're not posting on behalf of the site. They're oh. just posting because it's a public page. Oh, I so, got you. I got yeah. you. So so your, your question is to how do you uh, not allow the public posts? And you can't. Well, so Facebook does have some settings on that, and okay. and we'd have to go specifically and drill into that. I'm sure. I'm sure they're, uh, you know, as we saw, uh, you know, what's his face on in, on in the jury trial, right? And Facebook went through some serious litigations to about data uh, anonymous anon animosity and and so forth so they've added a lot of settings so i'm sure there's plenty of stuff that can be dug into there and i think uh the administrators can also set parameters that you mm -hmm. can review a post before it gets put maybe there's another added layer that mm -hmm. you can prevent it thank you you really trust those password managers that's on your computer because i'm afraid to do that i do so so i use LastPass, and i'm sure everyone's heard LastPass has been hacked a few times in the last whatever couple of years uh but what i can say is the encryption level that that the average criminal is willing to go through the average effort is not up to the level of what LastPass is going to do uh, I set all my passwords at 32 characters with upper lowercase special characters. I know none of them. I have hundreds of passwords. I don't know any of my own passwords. They're all encrypted in LastPass. If someone gets a hold of one of those, you know, I can go in and I can change all passwords around and I can change them in an instant. And I don't need to remember any of them because when I go online, I can be sure that that password is this long and it's going to be very hard to guess or 
mimic or go through a series of patterns to try to get. Yeah, LastPass is an application that stores all your passwords. If you have on your computer where your computer gives you the option to go ahead and save the password, you have to be careful of that because if you ever go on public Wi-Fi, uh, then anyone can have access to that as well. So it's, it's a little more dangerous if you allow your computer to save your passwords, saves them in one file, and a hacker could go ahead and get that. Don't use food or food food. That's all your passwords. That's another takeaway. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I would like to thank Trustee Astral for suggesting that we do this and all her help in putting it together this morning. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Very informative for our community and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you for making the time, all of you. Uh, There's donuts and coffee. Please take them. The policemen do not need to eat those. Mm, yeah. Good. Nice job. Good. Thank you.